Good morning, church. Will you stand with us? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Heavenly Father, thank you for your amazing power at work in our lives. Thank you for your goodness and your blessings over us. Thank you for your great love and care. Thank you that even in the midst of trial, we can give you praise. Thank you for the sacrifice that we might have freedom in life. Forgive us when we don't thank you enough for who you are, for all you do, for all that you've given. God, help us to set our eyes and hearts on you anew today, this morning, as we worship and praise around the table. We give you all the glory and praise today. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, and you are good.
have a seat today. I want to thank you so much um, for being here today and uh, remind you to fill out your We Care card today, regular visitors. Make sure that you drop that, our regular visitors, yeah. regular attenders, drop that in the offering as you go today. And if you're visiting, take it to the Welcome Center. 
you know, people always take care of me and give me communion cups up here. I've got like six up here. So if you forgot your communion cup, um, come on up. I'll give you one. I've got some to pass out up here. Uh, and don't forget, if, if you have a specific prayer request, please fill out a yellow card and leave that um, with the specific request and the offering as you go today. I do want to remind you, if you're wanting to attend, uh, not that you can't come that day, but it does help us in preparation for the Last Supper experience. Um, if you plan to attend part or all of that, to please sign up. I think right now we're close to 60. Um, we still have room, obviously. Um, so if you are interested in being part of that on Thursday, March 28th, so it's going to be a really solemn, worshipful night as we prepare our hearts for Resurrection Sunday on Easter Sunday. So excited about all of that. So you can turn in your Bibles today, um, and we're going to be in Jeremiah 17. We're going to be in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 again, kind of where we were at in, in the science series that we went through, or the science sermon in this series that we went through. But all in all, Hard Questions has been an incredibly difficult series, and although the response has been overwhelmingly positive and appreciative, um, I'm not going to lie, I'll be relieved to have a break as we close out today, but I want you to hear me as we think about the things that we've discussed over the last month and a half, if you've been here with us. The purpose of this series, <clears throat> excuse me, I will say this, the purpose of this series is not, hey, let's share info and, and let's rally together with what we think is right versus what they think is right so that we can have a firm platform to debate on. That's not the purpose of this series. It's, it's that you might have a better understanding. You may be informed from his word, have a better understanding of these questions as a whole, and so that you can practically, most importantly, biblically, address these things as you seek to live your lives on mission. That's the purpose of this. As you engage people who need to know the hope of Jesus Christ, amen? That is, that is why we walk through this. We've looked at several questions. Uh, the question is, is, if God is good, why do bad things happen? Like the question of why do we suffer? Uh, we looked at the question of aren't people who believe in the Bible ignoring science? Are science and scripture opposed to one another? Um, and we looked at the question of what is holy sexuality? And I, I'll be honest, again, if you missed a week, you can, you can go back, you can watch online, or you can contact me. I'm always happy to share my sermon transcripts or manuscripts if you like. But if I'm honest, I think today might be one of the most confusing, confounding, um, hard to wrap your mind around questions of our current culture. And that question is, where do I draw my identity? Where do I draw my identity from? Who am I? And I was tempted to briefly cover this in our Holy Sexuality Sermon, but it really is an entirely different topic now. It flows out of our culture's worship of, of sex and sexuality. It flows out of our culture's distorted definitions of what love is, but as a whole, it's a, it's a whole other thing, uh, and it really has to do with our core belief of who are we, and where did we come from, and what gives me, what gives you value as a human being? Now, speaking of the confusing nature of this question, I just wanted to share this quote with you this morning by Adam Curtis. He's a, the producer of a recent um, political documentary, and this is really in regard to politics, but I'll, I'll help you understand why I think this is pertinent to read today. And he writes, confusing and lying to your opponent is one way to win a war. In a new political strategy, politicians create narratives intended to confuse and destabilize our perception of reality in order to manage public thought. And I want to just read that again. In order to manage public thought. The idea is that if politicians can give the public no coherent narrative to react to, then they, can respond, they can't respond with a compelling dissenting narrative of their own. He says, it sums up the, the strange mood of our time where nothing really makes any coherent sense. Curtis says, we live in a constant vaudeville of contradictory stories that make it impossible for any real opposition to emerge because they can't counter it with a coherative, uh, coherent narrative of their own. And, and Mike, you may be asking, well, why are you sharing that, Brian? Because I believe this confusion tactic is a tactic that originated and is being used by our enemy. I believe that the spiritual battle behind the question that we're going to look at this morning is far more nefarious than we can really wrap our minds around and understand. So we need to understand our culture. 
And we need to understand this question, and we need to intentionally develop a godly understanding and response for people who are struggling with their identity so that we can have a, not so that we can have a firm debate on what is right and what is wrong, but so that we can share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, which we'll, we'll talk about a lot more. Because here's the reality, church. The, the greatest witness that you can have is the fruit of a life lived in the peace and grace and love of Jesus Christ. That people may see the fruit of a life in a narrative that's different from what other people see. And when the Holy Spirit opens up, and he will many times, uh, over and over, especially if we're faithful to walk through that door, opportunities for us to speak to the truth, um, we're going to have all kinds of, of, of great um, things that are going to happen. If you had told me that when I began in full-time ministry at this church that I would ever be up front needing to share a message on gender and identity, um, I would have told you, you're nuts. But if you fast forward 24 years, things have shifted very dramatically. And I will just say this, if things keep moving like they are, in 10 years, uh, I'll need to share a message about pedophilia. And in 25 years, I'll need to share a message about bestiality and why they're not good paths to pursue in life and why we shouldn't affirm these things as a culture. I just want us to understand that. And you may think, Brian, you're crazy. Okay, keep telling me that and talk to me in, in you know, a few years. And if you're visiting and you think, geez, that's not very culturally sensitive, I will say this with humility. I, I want to communicate to you. I'm not trying to be culturally sensitive. I'm seeking to be biblically sensitive because I believe that the Bible is the inspired words of our God and creator and maker. And he has loving boundaries within his creation and in our relationships, that if those boundaries are removed, create so much brokenness, that if we walk in his ways, it's, it's quite the opposite. There's peace and joy. It doesn't mean that we're always happy. It doesn't mean that we don't have difficulties, but there's peace and there's a contentedness and there's a joy. If you hear anything this morning of all the things that I want to share with you today, I want you to hear me. If you're here and you believe in the resurrected Jesus... Or if you don't believe, if you're here and you feel like you have a solid understanding of this is who I am and who God made me to be, or I just want to say this, if you're wrestling deeply with your identity, you are beautifully and wonderfully made, fearfully and wonderfully made. You are not mass-produced, meaningless, merely here by chance, and valuable only if you fit into whatever culture, the shifting culture holds up as valuable. You are valuable. And I believe Scripture declares it that each of you has a purpose and has infinite value in God's great plan here this morning. Regardless of how uh, mundane you feel like your life is, you have a purpose you were designed with intent no matter how you were conceived, whether inside or outside of a marriage, adopted, fostered, whether your college entrance scores were high or low, regardless of your waistline, your complexion, your abilities, your successes, your failures, God does not make mistakes and he loves you. Now, I want to jump into this question and to begin, we need to understand first and foremost that the goalposts have moved. Um, and I, I just say that because um, I like football, and you know, if you've been following the, the, the offseason, the Bears are making a lot of moves. It's a good thing. But the goalposts have moved. I think it would help to define gender as we begin today. Gender used to be used synonymous with sex. Either you had male or female reproductive organs. That is no longer how this word is being used. If you want to have a conversation with someone who needs to know about the hope of Jesus Christ, you have to understand that many don't see gender that way anymore. The word gender is used completely differently. The word gender is now used to describe how people will express themselves, clothing, mannerism, in mannerisms, interests, cultural expectations. It relies more on head and heart than on the actual, physical, obvious, biological differences that make us male and female, man and woman. The new definition is ambiguous, to say the least, again, creating a lot of confusion, which I believe is the tactic of our enemy, create discontent and confusion and doubt. Now, the idea of gender dysphoria, if we would define that, defined a state of severe distress 
or unhappiness caused by feeling that one's gender identity does not match one's sex as registered at birth has now been changed to gender incongruence and is no longer considered a mental disorder, which it had been for decades in the world of secular psychology. Now the question is, why has that been removed? Why has that been altered? So that there is no longer a stigma surrounding it in the belief that care surrounding the issue could be improved. Now, in my opinion, that's ill-informed. It lacks foundation and it opens the door for psychology to become completely, to, to completely change. Why try to help people with their emotional or behavioral health? Just affirm them and say, this is you, embrace it. Basically, every issue of the head and heart then would be affirmed, which um, for those who see scripture as authoritative, that's dangerous. Jeremiah chapter 17, beginning with verse 9 says, I really ought not to always trust my heart. The human heart, it says, is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. That's why David prayed, search me, God, know my heart, test me, know my anxious thoughts, point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. That's a God psychology for us right there. Again, the new definition of gender contends that the ideas of gender are a social construct, not based off of reproductive genitalia. And the thought is if you, you can identify with whatever you feel that day, So gender identities now include male, female, transgender, gender neutral, non-binary, agender, pangender, genderqueer, two-spirit, third gender, and all, none, or a combination of these as defined by the World Health Organization and now taught in a vast majority of our public schools. So it would do well to understand that when it comes to the word gender, our culture has moved the goalposts, but we also must understand that culture does not get to dictate gender. God does, and and more on that in a moment. But everything that we see is culturally driven for for, in in so many ways. I don't want to say everything that we see, but so many things that we see. We have an idea of what masculine and feminine is based on our culture, and culture is always changing. So I just want to kind of make a little bit of a point on this when it comes to trends and truth which I think is a huge part of this discussion. We have an idea of what masculine and feminine is based on our culture. Um, You're wearing a dress, you have long hair, you're a girl. Um, Again, tell that to sissy boy William Wallace, by the way. Um, Knight and resistance leader, famous for his part in the first Scottish war. if, if If he's not masculine, I don't know who is, but he probably fit the cultural norm of the 1300s, wearing a kilt and having long hair. Right? Culture changes and shifts. It hurts my achy, breaky heart that mullets came back. <laughs> I thought that they died in the 90s with my pegged jeans, um, but they're back. I love gender reveal parties. You know, people are dying at these things, crashing airplanes, blowing each other up. Um, blue means boy, pink means girl. Where did the blue means boy, pink means girl thing come from? That's culturally driven. You know, ladies have hair on their legs and in their armpits. I'm teaching you guys all kinds of new things today. (laughs) Shaving is a cultural thing. Go over to Europe. I'm not advocating that the ladies in our church lose their razors. I don't want to get a reputation. You know that church out on State Road 3? (laughs) None of the ladies shave their arms in pits. I'm not trying to beat up our culture. I'm not anti-pink or anti-blue or anti-mullet, kind of am, (laughs) anti-shaving. I'm just saying let trends be trends and let truth be truth. Culture does not get, culture doesn't supersede God's word. I'm just trying to make a point this morning. At the end of the day, culture does not get to define male and female. What does God say about gender? Genesis chapter one, again, if you want to go back to the root of this, go back to our Uh, our discussion on science and scripture. If you remove the beginning, it's the wild west out here. If you remove the beginning and our origins of where we came from and who we are and why we're here, then all bets are off. Genesis 1, beginning with verse 26, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image, In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So powers that be may change definitions, 
But God's word says he made us man and woman. He made us to work together to steward his creation. We were made uh, for relationship, and that just, just doesn't mean marriage. We were made to work together to balance one another out. We weren't made to be alone. Within our God-given purpose, God's kingdom is best seen in people coming together in their strengths and weaknesses, male and female, with Jesus as the head. There is a completeness in this. Further, Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 20, but still there was no helper. We'll talk about that word, word helper in a moment. That word is ezer konegdo, but that word helper in the Hebrew. Um, there was no helper just right for him, for Adam. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while the man slept, the Lord God took out, of the man's, uh, took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made woman from the rib and He brought her to the man. At last the man exclaimed, This one is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She'll be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Again, that word helper in the Hebrew is ezer konegdo, meaning strengthening it in a way they cannot do themselves. It's, It's a poor interpretation to say it means less than or secondary. It is best understood as opposite sides. Like if you don't have one, the other will tip over. Uh, it's, it's, it's saying if you don't have one, the other will fall. Male and female are interdependent on one another, one incomplete without the other. But you'll see this narrative throughout the text, male and female. In a, in a little while, we'll talk about some different things that people are trying to say about the text. But listen, whatever culture desires to do with gender move the goalposts, whatever. At the end of the day, as a follower, followers of Jesus Christ, the authority, we submit to the authority of his word. Now, as we've talked about so many times, understand this, Christian brothers and sisters here today, not everyone, in fact, the growing majority do not see God's word as authoritative in their lives. So coming from an argument, well, the Bible says doesn't hold water out there anymore like it maybe once did. What does, what does hold water is understanding where people are coming from and why, being willing to share your story of where you came from and why and how the gospel has changed and is changing your life and that they can look upon the fruit of your walk with Christ and be presented with a better narrative. And as Peter would tell us, the Holy Spirit is going to open up opportunities for us to speak truth, and we do that, and we take the opportunity, and we're ready with an explanation of what God is doing in our lives. It's not just words coming out of our mouths, but a life lived for Jesus. And I would contend that the reason we're seeing so many as well in the church at large allowing the goalposts to be moved, seeing absolutely no issue with definitions changing and trends being held up as truth is because too many in the church don't hold up his word as their authority, and they're not hearing it taught from their pulpits and in their classes and in their small groups. Remember, the average American household has three Bibles. The average American uh, who has a percentage of Americans who have actually read their scriptures, 11%. And I would imagine those seeking to grow in their understanding of the scriptures is even less than that 11%. Let's keep tracking. Why the shift? So the goalposts have shifted. They've moved. But why have things shifted? How did we take trends and mistake those with truth. I think really a root of this problem, I think, has much to do with acceptance and value. What does it mean to be a man or a woman? What does, what, what does it mean to be a person of value in the world that we live in? Everyone being funneled into, here's what you have to be, and people who don't fit, the, the, the norms that we'll see, which I would argue is, is a pretty big group, and who don't know that there is a God who loves them deeply and made them for a purpose, or who have lost sight of God and feel lost. And then culture comes along now with some new things and has presented a place to fit and to find acceptance and to find community. We ask lots of, like, what does it mean to be masculine? I have a hard time forgetting a conversation I once had with a gentleman in the church many years ago. I jokingly talked about how hard it was going to be when um, a guy showed up at my door wanting to date my daughter and how I would be tempted, as I was even when I went on a kindergarten field trip with Ella, to intimidate. Um, There was, yeah, I I was trying to intimidate a kindergarten kid that was trying to hold my daughter's hand. Like, 
Lisa's like, Brian, that's completely inappropriate. I'm like, I don't care. This little boy was after my girl. I, I don't like that. Um, but I, I jokingly said, you know, it's going to be hard. I'm, I, I'm just going to probably feel like I want to just intimidate this guy. I, I don't know. Probably not be as nice as I should be. And he scoffed and he looked at me and said, you're, not, you're barely 5'7". You're overweight. You couldn't intimidate anybody. Let a, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Let a real man come over and take care of that for you. Uh, he often, often ridiculed me because, you know, I liked art and I liked music. Somehow that made me less of a man. Um, and yes, I did take a pottery class at the CLC, and I dominated, all right? <laughs> My bowl didn't collapse like everybody else's. These are the ridiculous things that we feed into. And, and I'll be honest with you, going back to that conversation, the fact that I felt bitter about it shows that I buy in. What does it mean to, to have value in our culture? Even our Christian culture often does this. How many times are we going to say, come as you are in your brokenness, Everyone's welcome, rich or poor, but often what you see up front in churches or in the, these worship videos that you see online are the most culturally well-dressed, beautiful people. I'm not saying that Elevation Worship needs to put out a worship video with some guy that just rolled out of bed, doesn't look like he washed his hair for three weeks in his pajama pants. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm also saying is, you know, normal-looking people don't, don't sell, Right? I may be going too far with this, but I think the American Christian culture uh, is, is so much now about marketing and money. It's another genre. And it's concerning to me. And I'll say this, you know, we went to the Lauren Daigle concert last week. Her testimony and witness to her relationship with Jesus Christ was amazing. It is not all bad out there. I, I know I'm getting on a soapbox. I'm just saying, where do we draw our value? Is it in the things that I can do, the way that I look? If it's the ever-changing cultural dictates of what a man or a woman or should be or what's successful and what's cool and I've got to fit into this mold, there are going to be a majority of people who feel lost and the enemy preys on the hopeless and the searching. May we not follow suit as churches presenting just one more place where I've got to try to figure out how to fit in and often miss the mark. Where is it that we draw our identity? And again, this topic has moved out of the realm of holy sexuality that we discussed a few weeks ago and to it a deep, intrinsic issue of who am I? Do I have any worth if I don't fit into the pocket that I'm supposed to? Do I have any worth if I don't look the way I'm supposed to? Do I have any worth if I'm not good at the things I'm supposed to be good at? We would contend at the South Mil Milford Church of Christ that you are who God says you are, that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, regardless if you fit into whatever around you says makes you valuable, whether you've got a size 4 or size 20 waist, whether you I don't know how that works. Whether you throw a football or you play an instrument or neither, you are valuable because he made you in his image. Now, there are a few relevant pieces of kindling that continue to get thrown on this fire that are really making it hard to put out. And I know that you guys think I'm anti-social media, and I kind of am, all right? I'm not going to judge you if you have it. I know there are a lot of you that do, and for work reasons and all those different things. But the phenomenon that social media has created is a space where, to be honest, a huge percentage of people spend a huge percentage of time on, where we compare ourselves to others. But when we see only 5% of their lives, only the good, amazing things, the filtered and edited pictures, no one is in reality ever going to be able to keep up with that, but so many people often try to. Like, why can't I be like this family who has it all together? Just understand that you're only seeing a small percentage of their lives, the part they want you to see. Secondly, worship, the worship of sex and image in the porn industry is a huge issue. There isn't a lot of explaining needed here. People live in a fantasy world where sexuality is something to take and to consume rather than a gift given to us by God. It's a place where people are commodities rather than human beings with a purpose and value. Thirdly, definitions of love. Love is oftentimes, I'm not saying always, but oftentimes in our culture, all about emotion and feeling and hormonal things. It is so much more than that. It is a daily decision, intentional decision of self-sacrifice for others according to what I read in God's word. And then again, the removal of God as creator. If we're here randomly, again, all bets are off. It's the Wild West. If these areas are, and more are the construct that we live in, that so many people live in every day, 
It's, is it any wonder that people are searching? Is it any, any wonder that people are bitter? Is it any wonder that people are broken and even going to extreme places to find some place to find community and meaning? We are all created with longings and definitively the deepest thirst of every human being, whether they will ever acknowledge it or not, is to know God and have a relationship with him built on the love, grace, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. As human beings, we need acceptance and identity and security. We need purpose. And even though earthly relationships and our life's endeavors will, to a degree, provide that for us, only God, our creator, can truly meet a person's deepest needs. Jesus is the living water that completely satisfies the inner thirst that nothing in this world, no relationship, no accomplishment, no ability to fit the construct could ever quench. And church, may our stories as we have encountered God cut through the fog of our culture and the confusion and the lies of our enemy to bring to the surface the truth, to counter the lies. Maybe it's too simplistic, but I believe the core issue here is a gospel issue that people need to know they have value and they are loved. You won't be able to legislate this change. You won't be able to yell people into this change. I'm not saying that those things are bad. We need that. But it's going to happen, the real, true, lasting change when the church lives out the gospel and pursues those who are lost and broken. So how do we offer hope to the searching? The reality is gender dysphoria is a real issue in a, a small group within our world. 0.6% globally struggle with gender dysphoria. That's a small number in ratio, but we need to remember that Jesus left the 99 to go after the one. Don't write these people off. And there's no place for coarse joking within the body of Christ about this. He loves those who are struggling with this. These individuals often feel like they're trapped in the wrong body, and I can't imagine trying to live a life as a follower of Jesus feeling like you were made in the wrong body. How much love and Christian support from God's people would someone need to walk out their life with this struggle? And I'm not saying love and Christian support is affirmation. There's also a quickly growing group of others uh, that, where their gender dysphoria involves what we call groupthink, specifically teenage girls. Just as studies have shown group dynamics have in eating disorders among young women, we're seeing this in the rise of the number of biological girls seeking referrals to begin changing their sex. And I'll quote this morning. It said, the, a quote that I wanted to read says, in, many, uh, in, in the past few years, it has become an explosion. And again, this is a quote um, from a secular uh, physician who chose to be unnamed because of her fear of actually saying this. In the past few years, it's become an explosion. Many of us feel confused by what has happened, and it's often hard to talk to our colleagues about it, said a London-based psychiatrist working in a child and adolescent mental health unit who has been a consultant for the past 17 years who asked for anonymity due to the sensitivity of the subject. She says, I have been one I have been, I might have seen one child with a gender dysphoria Every two years when I started practicing, it was very niche and rare. Now somewhere between 10 and 20% of my caseload is made of adolescents registered as female at birth who identify as non-binary or trans with just an occasional male registered teenager who identifies as trans. Another senior uh, child psychiatrist said, girls who wanted to transition made up 5% of her caseload. In the last five to 10 years, we've seen a huge surge in young women who at the age of 12 or 13 want to become boys. They've changed their name, and they are pressing to have hormones or puberty, block, puberty blockers. The psychiatrist added, often those girls are children who are going through the normal identity and developmental problems of adolescence and finding a solution for themselves in this way. Church, shunning those who are struggling to find where they fit in this world. If, if that's the advice that you've gotten, is quite the opposite of what our rabbi taught us. Jesus didn't hang out with the 99 to be a light where there was already a light, and he didn't chase the one to become the one. He went out to bring that one home, to make what was lost found. The last thing we need in our world right now are, number one, churches that shun, are churches that affirm. And for whatever reason, that seems to be the stance that the church takes. Rather than to be a church who is living in the tension of truth and grace, However it is, I would remind you this morning that you came into this world um, that, that goes out to tell people, however it is that you came into this world, 
you are, there's nothing wrong with you. As far as you're not a mistake. God made you beautifully and wonderfully and fearfully. You have value. You are loved. And, and listen, there's so much more that I just don't have time to unearth on all of this. Uh, as, as the case in every one of these sermons, I prayed and pray that you'll diligently seek biblical understanding of these topics. There are debates that you'll hear uh, that, that are going to gonna surface about eunuchs in the scriptures. Um, and if you've never heard of that word before, biblically speaking, a eunuch was a man born with a genital deformity or who had been involved in an accident that caused the deformity or who voluntarily was castrated as part of a pagan system of worship and servitude. The debate involves eunuchs and Jesus' words about them and uh, the text giving precedence to more than two genders accepted by the Bible. I will just tell you this, without going into detail, the debates are a massive stretch and require reading your agenda into the scriptures. That is not how we engage the word of God. And to study the Bible that way, it, you can make the Bible whatever you want it to be. And as I've said to you before, and again, I'm not trying to be culturally sensitive. I'm seeking to be biblically sensitive because of the way that I view Scripture. It is the authority in my life. It is the authority in our world, whether people will acknowledge that or not. The question is, what is the message that we believe about ourselves as we walk with Jesus? And what is our message to those who are searching? lost in confusion, in the fog, and needing hope. My hope is that you're living in a place where you know I've been made complete in Christ. Let's look, at, let's look at a few things. For someone who believes they're not enough, my prayer is that they can look at your life and, you can, and you're living within the truth. I've been made complete in Jesus Christ because people will see that. And that when they ask, you know, Colossians 2.10 says, so you, are also, you also are complete through your union with Jesus, who is head over every ruler and authority. Jesus is the head of my life. I'm complete in him, and I have peace. For those who don't, they're not sure what's right and what's wrong. You can, you can say, I was formerly in darkness, but I live in the light I can see. Ephesians 5.8-9 through 9 tells me, I don't live in the dark. I don't live in the fog. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as a people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. And for those people around you that don't feel like they have a purpose, may you live as if you have a purpose. That I am God's workmanship. I've been created to produce good works. God didn't mean it. I'm not some meaningless thing that was mass produced that's just here by chance. Because you know the text. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 declares, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. And for those people out there that think there's something wrong with me, you can live out the fact that you're redeemed and forgiven by the grace of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, beginning with verse 4, even before he made the world, God loved us and he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and, he, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he's poured out into us who belong to his dear son. He's so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of Jesus and forgave us our sins. He showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. And here's the big one, church. For those who say, I've got nobody. I have no community. I'm alone. May we live out that I have been made one with all who are in Christ Jesus. Galatians chapter 3, for all who are children of God through Christ, for all are children of God in Christ Jesus, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave, free, male, female, for you are all one in Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are true children of Abraham. You are heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. If we don't offer a message and we don't offer community, here's the reality right now. The world's offering it. 
There are so many people who are flocking to these places, so many young ladies, so many young kids, because they are alone and they have no community, and they found a community that will accept them and affirm them. If we believe that God made us all fearfully and wonderfully, how can we pick and choose who has love and value? That's what our culture does. Who do we share the gospel with and who do we shun? That's a question to wrestle with. May we leave the 99 and go to the one, but we don't go to the one to affirm the one. We go to bring the one home and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a message of hope, church. Amen? It's the hope that we celebrate. This, this bread and cup, it's not just, okay, we do this every service. We celebrate the resurrected Jesus Christ here every week. The bread and the cup that represent his body and blood shed because you were that precious to him. Every single one of you in the room. We have a message of hope that we celebrate weekly, daily, moment by moment in our walk with him. As we prepare to meditate this morning, may we give God thanks for the hope we have in Christ. And may we intentionally look for opportunities to share the hope with the people that are around us. We don't share these things. I don't want to preach this so that you have a firmer debate platform that you can argue with people about. I want to share this so you understand the, 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 the climate of the culture that you're in as you seek to live your life on mission, as you seek to bring the gospel to people, as you seek to live in the tension of truth and grace, as you seek to bring your story of how God's working in your life to those who desperately need hope and community and love, godly love in their lives. In a moment, I'll come up and lead you through the emblems. Again, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup and he said, this is my blood. 
blood of the covenant shed for the forgiveness of many sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Church, it's the blood shed for us, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that makes us clean and spotless and holy. This morning, as we prepare to sing this time in this time of invitation, for those of you who have been walking with Jesus Christ, again, it's always a reminder, like, we can lose sight of it. We can lose, we can lose sight of it so quick that we've been made fearfully and wonderfully, that every person in this room has value and a purpose within God's plan. I believe that with every ounce of who I am. God does not make mistakes. In church, there are so many that live in this culture trying to fit the mold, trying to fit whatever they feel brings them value and struggling so deeply. We have a message, church. Share your story. Share your story of who you are in Christ. If you're here this morning and you've not made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, you've been thinking about it, come and talk to me. If you're ready, the baptistry is ready, Repent of your sins. Please turn, turn to Jesus. Confess your faith in him as risen Lord and be buried in the waters of baptism today. Let's stand. Let's sing. Good morning, church. It's great to have you here today. Don't look over your shoulder. It started up again. <laughs> Thought this morning, kind of, that's what our lives are like. We have this beautiful weather and everything's going well, and then all of a sudden, the storms hit. And in reality, our storm is covered by Jesus Christ, which Brian brought up today. So I'm so glad for that, and I hope you are too. So thank you for being here today. I want to remind you, I have a request that please fill out the yellow card. Drop it um, and leave it in the offering as you exit this morning, and it will be addressed. And then we have some uh, things to look at today. Please check your bulletins. They have everything in that you need. Um, and the following the activities I'd like to highlight. Our annual Bunny Brunch is coming up on Saturday, March 23rd at 10 a.m. See your newsletter and bulletins for more information. If you'd like to help, I'm sure Deb would be glad to have you a helper. Just give her a call. As with the... Um, stuffing of the eggs, if you 
I know some of the uh, small groups have done it, but I think there is still some more to stuff for that. Um, please see your newsletter regarding the Last Supper experience. I'm really looking forward to Monday, Thursday. I think it'll be a great night. I think we have over 60 signed up already. And uh, please RSVP so we make sure we have enough food covered and it'll be a night to uh, reflect on our Savior. Also, don't forget about our annual resurrection breakfast on Easter Sunday. For those that like to be up early, it'll be at 8 a.m. before the first service. Sign up in the uh, Say Yes Center to be on the schedule to trim or spray for the weeds outside. Um, we want to catch them before they uh, start making a mess. So check with Aaron, Wade on, or Aaron Smith on that, and he has details. Also notice in the uh, bulletin today, we have a blood drive this Thursday. If we have enough people, I think 10 or 12 have signed up. We need 22 to 24. We've done it years ago, but not recently. And so if you'd like to do that, see me or just go online to Red Cross, find our church and take your spot. And that will be from noon to six this Thursday. Also check your mailboxes today. There is a surprise inside, I'm told. So everybody likes surprises. As we think about today's message, I want to close with Psalm 139, 14, which says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full and well. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today, hearts full of gratitude and awe for the marvelous works of your hands. You have fearfully and wonderfully made us, knitting us together in our mother's wombs, crafting each one of us with intention and care, each trait, each quirk, with each character reflects your righteousness and thoughtfulness. Lord, help us to see and appreciate the divine craftsmanship in one another. Remind us that our spouse is a masterpiece created by your hands. Teach us to honor and cherish unique ways that you have formed us, Lord recognizing the beauty in our differences and the strength of our day. So strengthen us, Lord, that we may grow together in faith and love and the knowledge of you. Amen. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. So the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. My praise. From death to life, cause grace we wrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the right. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. God bless. Have a great day today.